sharpening hand plane blades. The top six mistakes that folks make when learning how to do this. What I'm going to do is show you how to overcome those top six mistakes. If you're struggling, you want to watch this. This just might be the ticket to help you pull off this kind of work. I'm Rob Cosman and welcome to my shop. First problem we encounter is the grip. Now you don't necessarily have to do it exactly the way I do it, but whatever you do, you want to do it the same way every time. Very much like golf or pool or anything where your grip is really critical to your result. I find it the same with this. If you do it the same way every time and things just kind of fit into place and you'll learn to be able to do this without even thinking about it. Here's how I choose to hold it. I'm right-handed. I grab it with my right hand, my index finger, and my fingers are just kind of falling into that groove in the middle. Index fingers on the far point. I take my right, my, pardon me, my left index finger and I put it in the hole and that kind of becomes my indexing point. Now you'll also notice I'm not holding it like this, I'm on a bit of an angle and I'll show you why in a moment. Now I want to have as many fingers along that cutting edge as possible to evenly disperse the pressure. So pinky, ring finger, middle finger, and I bring the index finger of my right hand around so that I now have all four fingers and they're lined up right on the front. Not way back here, but right on the front. Now the problem is applying the correct amount of pressure, but we'll address that separately. I like to have my right thumb between my left thumb and my left index finger. What that allows me to do is to tie these two hands together. So instead of having two hands operating independently, they operate as one. And you want a nice comfortable grip. So that's how I hold it. Don't hold it excessively tight. Light to moderate is how I would describe it. Bench height or sharpening height. I discovered this when I started teaching folks how to do it and I recognized that this is a difficult task in order to pick up if you don't have everything lined up perfectly. The average person attempts to sharpen at bench height. Why wouldn't they? Well, here's what occurs. You've got your stone, you're holding onto your blade, now you're up here. And most people are using on some kind of a stone that wears, whether it be a water stone or a ceramic. So if you're just doing your circles right here, and you can do circles or figure eights, I just happen to find circles are easier to do. You're doing your little circles right here, and you realize rather rapidly that if you just stay in that one spot, you're gonna prematurely dish that stone. So to this motion, you introduce this motion. And for the average person to do this and this at the same time becomes extremely difficult. There's another problem, and that is you're pivoting essentially from your wrist. Well, I try to teach people how to sharpen. I recognize that that is something very difficult to do. So here's how we cure it. My bench height is just a little bit above my knee. It's going to be a little bit different for everyone, but what it allows me to do are primarily two things. Number one, by leaning over top of the stone, when I want to cover more of the stone, instead of moving my arms this way, I simply rock heel and toe while I'm doing these little circles. And by the way, you want to make sure that you keep that blade on an angle so that as you're doing those circles, you're staying on the stone. If you're doing it this way, you're going to be off the stone part of the time. The biggest advantage of this is the fact that you get to move your pivot point from your wrist all the way up to your shoulder. So when I'm in position to sharpen, I lock my wrist, I lock my elbow, and pivoting is from the shoulder, and it's much easier to maintain those precious angles for the few seconds you have to do it when you can get your pivoting point as far away as possible. So find your primary bevel, elevate two or three degrees, lock everything, and just do those little circles slowly migrating out over the stone while you're doing it to even out the wear. Your grip needs to be light to moderate, very comfortable. The stone doesn't need excessive pressure to cut. It'll cut its job a little more than gravity, with a little more than gravity acting on the, plane, on the blade. So you're going to hold that in place. And I've got a comfortable grip. that I'm not forcing the blood out of my fingertips. Find that primary bevel, raise up slightly, and I can feel what's going on on the stone. If you push excessively hard, you can't do that. And that may sound a little bit crazy, but as you learn to do this, you'll understand you can actually feel it cutting. So a light to moderate grip, and if I were to illustrate somehow, 
I would say if you think about how much pressure it takes to just start to compress a firm grape, that's about how much pressure you're wanting to apply with the blade on the stone. The fourth problem is also it has to do with pressure, uneven pressure. Here's what's happening. You're using four fingers on the cutting edge of that blade to distribute the pressure. And if you think about it, this pressure, this finger, my index finger and my middle finger are accustomed to applying a lot more pressure than my pinky and my ring finger. So people have a tendency to push excessively hard up here. You have to learn to apply the same amount of pressure with all four fingers. And if you think about a light pressure to begin with, that's a lot easier to do. So when I set that blade down on the primary bevel, locate it, raise up three or two or three, maybe as many as four degrees above it, light to moderate pressure with all four fingers. Start that process. You can feel the stone cutting, light to moderate pressure. Same amount being pressed here as here, as here, as here. And you want to apply that pressure uniformly on all four so that you don't A, deflect the blade, believe it or not, you can, and B, you don't end up creating a skew on the end of the blade because you put too much pressure on one side. So you need to practice that a little bit, but just easy, light to moderate, that's the key, light to moderate. We straighten the edge on this stone first, and that's verified by a burr, and that burr has to go corner to corner. If my finger pressure, problem number three, was, I, was uniform across the cutting edge, and I was up off of the primary bevel, about 10 seconds of work on that stone will produce a slight burr that you can easily feel with your finger. And if that burr runs corner to corner, and as I said, the uniform pressure, then you can pretty much bet that that edge is going to be perfectly straight from there to there. So the problem is, I can't get the burr. Well, that's a matter of controlling the rocking, applying the right amount of pressure. So here's what we gotta go through. This nice big, and this is the advantage of a thick blade, it gives you a fairly wide, in comparison anyway, primary bevel. And that nice wide primary bevel is easy to locate when you set it down on that flat stone. Now, when you first start, what you'll find is you rock a fair bit, and pretty soon that'll go from being flat to being somewhat radius. And as soon as that happens, then you cannot locate it, so you've got to go to your grinder and restart with a new, fresh primary bevel. If I can find my primary bevel, then I have to kind of take a mental note of, okay, there's where that is. And at that point, I've locked everything. I've locked my wrist, I've locked my elbow, my hands, nice light to moderate pressure. Then I'm gonna raise up purposely, a little more than the 25 degree primary bevel. So let's say we're sitting somewhere between 28 and maybe as much as 31 degrees. At this point, feeling the same amount of pressure on all my fingers, I do my little circles. Now, if you're doing big circles, you're gonna be running your blade like this. If you go small, tight circles, then that rocking is gonna be minimized. And within 10 seconds of work, you should be able to detect a slight burr. Now when I run my finger over there, I can feel a slight burr that runs corner to corner. It doesn't have to be extremely big, just enough that you can actually identify it and say, okay, I know that there's a burr there. The burr tells me I've created a new edge because the metal has effectively rolled around. So I saved number six, not necessarily as the, in order of importance or frequency, but it's the one that can catch you without realizing what happened. Your plain blade typically comes with a primary bevel that's somewhere around 25 degrees. Now, I think 25 degrees is just a compromise. If you made the blade, the angle too acute, you just don't have enough metal out here. And if you make it too blunt, or pardon me, too obtuse, it's not going to work because of the way it sits in the plane. And that's the part that we need to talk about. So your plane blade is designed to be held in a bench plane like this, this happens to be a five and a half, this thing right here called the frog holds the blade at a fixed angle of 45 degrees. That's the angle with which the blade meets the wood. We might call it the attack angle. All right, so if the blade is sitting in there at 45 degrees, you want the leading part or the toe of the blade to touch the wood first. We have the toe and we have the heel. As long as you stay under 45 degrees, the toe is always going to be first. The plane's going to work just fine. Sometimes when you're freehand sharpening, 
without realizing it, especially on that third bevel, you get up above 45 degrees. And if you do that, now what's going to happen is, as small as it is, the heel of that very tiny third bevel is going to actually touch before the toe and the blade plane is not going to function. It'll get a bit of a grab and then it'll come up out of the wood and you're wondering what in the name of blazes is going on. So the first thing to do after you've struggled with that for a minute or two and realize it's not your sharpening and it's not, this, it's not how sharp the edge of the blade is, the angles don't have anything to do with that really, it's not how you've put the blade back in the plane. Take it out, put it on, now this happens to be a combination square, it's a PEC, so I'm going to put this on here because it's held in 45 degrees and I just want to see if the, if the edge actually catches, cut, catches the wood and it does. So I know I've got the clearance, I've got at least the amount of clearance underneath here that needed in order for the plane to function. If you discover that it does not bite, then you know at some point you've raised up above 45 degrees. The solution, well depending on how bad it is, you may need to go back to your grinder and reestablish your primary bevel at 25 and just start over and just kind of be aware that secondary bevel created on the 1000 grit stone needs to be higher than the primary of 25 but cannot exceed 45. Best to stay closer to the 25. Third bevel, we call it the tertiary, done on the 16000 grit stone need only be higher than the secondary bevel created on the 1000. So higher than the secondary but again cannot exceed 45. And if you stay within those parameters, you're going to be fine. All right, if this is what you're looking for, just follow those instructions. Now, if there's something that you're struggling with that we didn't cover, we'd love to hear about it. Put it in the comments section and we'll address it in a future video. Don't forget to subscribe. And also don't forget to hit that bell, which will notify you the next time we come out with another video.